One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you by the Innovation Garden State, a Prosperity New Jersey initiative, PSE&G, the St. Barnabas Healthcare System, Seton Hall University, and by the Private Bank at Summit Bank. Additional funding is provided by the Mix Group of Companies, New Jersey Division of Youth and Family Services, Community Education Centers, and by Qualcare and by these public-spirited corporations and organizations. Steve Adubato. For the next half hour, we're going to be going one-on-one -on -one with the author of a book that uh, has had a great impact on me. It's called Fatherless America, Confronting Our Most Urgent Social Problem. The author is David Blankenhorn. He is with us, and we'll be talking about fatherhood and uh, why some folks are not living up to their responsibilities as dads and the impact it's having not just on children but on society. One-on-one -on -one with David Blankenhorn. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Jersey, one in ten people are currently working in a high-tech sector like biopharmaceutical, telecom, e-commerce, or IT. That's more scientific and technical brain power per capita than any other state. When a high-tech workforce is in high demand, it's no wonder so many companies are taking a closer look at New Jersey. After all, it's where people who live for high-tech live. New Jersey, the innovation garden state where brilliant ideas grow. It's the engine that powers New Jersey. It brings electricity to our neighborhoods, and the people of PSE and G make it work. For nearly 100 years, we've been working to supply energy for New Jersey's needs, providing power for businesses and lighting the way home. At the dawn of a new century, New Jersey's success will depend on the commitment of all of its citizens. The men and women of PSE and G are ready for that challenge. On Sunday morning and I had a pain in my chest. I went through all kinds of tests and they told me then that I had a heart attack. I'm the first person east of the Mississippi to have a seven bypass surgery without a heart lung machine. Beth Israel was the best hospital. It's like a miracle. St. Barnabas, we believe in miracles. Welcome back. You're looking at David Blankenhorn. He is the author, and the book is Fatherless America. You're seeing it right there, confronting our most urgent social problem. David, welcome to One on One. Good to be with you. I've been wanting to speak to you for many years since I, since I read your book. The um, premise of your book is a fascinating one. And if I could say it, you tell me if I'm wrong, that we are failing our children in many ways, and that uh, too many of our children are growing up without a dad. Why? Well, it's about four in ten children in the country don't live with their fathers now. Uh, about more than half are going to spend at least a big part of their childhood living apart from their fathers. And, um, I, I, you know, I think it's the biggest problem we have in the country. Uh, it's the kind of engine that's driving a lot of the other social problems that we're seeing. If you want to look at issues of um, crime and juvenile delinquency or teen pregnancy or child abuse and neglect or children living in poverty. Um, it's so closely connected with this trend of the fathers not being there, you know, and it's just, a, you know, it's a, it's a simple enough issue. Do children need their fathers? You know, do they need their fathers? 
And uh, when you, it, excuse me for talking. How does it impact on all those other issues you just mentioned? <coughs> Which, before you got into the work you're doing right now, and we're putting up the website of the institute that you had. You were doing a lot of community organizing and, and looking at a lot of these social questions, and then you're saying, wait a minute, the core problem is something a little bit different. What's the connection? Well, you know, if you think about a child, uh, what's the, what are the, what does the child want most? You know, what does a child need the, more than anything else? A child needs uh, for his mother and father to love him, love him or her, and to love one another, to be there. They, the child, more than clothes and money and toys and, you know, ne just needs the, that strong relationship with the mother and father. Now, if you take the father out of the picture, you're going to get children that are much more likely to be financially uh, in trouble, uh, educationally, uh, in, in every other way. You know, the boy, you know, the boys, for example, that grow up without a father in the home are much more likely to get in trouble with the police and end up in jail. Uh, the girls are much more likely to um, be uh, sexually uh, uh, active before they should be, have uh, children mm -hmm. as teenagers or before they're married. Statistics know? bear these conclusions out. Sure. The, the, if you look at the uh, issue of crime, p some people think, oh, you know, it's, it's a racial. You know, we're locking up the black guys. And um, there is a racial disparity, but whether or not you have a father in your life is a more important predictor of whether of your risk factor for getting in trouble with the police than s your skin color or where you live or how much money is in your family. It, it's the father. Look, you know, the, um, the, 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 the boy at a certain point has to separate a little bit from his mother. Why? Because he needs to find out the meaning of his masculinity. He needs to find out what it means that I'm embodied as a male. And his mother can't tell him that. He needs a man to tell him that. He goes on this kind of journey, you know, to figure out what it means to be a man. And the father, if the father is there and loving, can kind of, kind of knight him, man. You know, you're you're a man, you're a man. You know, and he, and the father says through words and deeds, you know, you want to be a strong man. Good, but I want you to be because you're my son. Strong man means treating other people right. Mm. Means treating women right. The boys that don't have the fathers there to help them come to terms with the meaning of their masculinity are the young boys that are much more at risk of answering this question, what does it mean to be a man, in the wrong way, you know? They're going to say, I'm a strong man because if you look at me the wrong way, I'll hurt you. I'm a man because uh, I'll sleep with my girlfriends and, you know, they'll have my babies and that makes me a strong man. They've gotten their meaning of masculinity where, you know, from the peer group, the gang, from television, movies, you know, the, all the wrong places. Then, the, the, So the boys, without the father, to help them figure out what it means to be a, a good man, a strong man, mm. they're the ones that are at risk for this kind of protest masculinity, you know, that kind of exaggerated, swaggering, violent, treat women bad masculinity. Which has absolutely nothing to do with being a real man. Which has nothing to do, but if you watch the movies and you go on the streets, you're going to figure out, you're going to think that's what it means. I'll tell you what, Dave, we're going to go out to a break. I promise this next segment will be much longer. We'll get into more depth about uh, the other issues that you raise in your book, Fatherless America, Confronting Our Most Urgent social problem one-on-one -on -one with David Wagonhorn. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, there is a revolution going on at Seton Hall. But that's because there's a revolution going on outside. Every Seton Hall student is given an IBM ThinkPad before they ever start classes. Professors then use the laptops as a basic teaching tool. With this new style, the teachers use an overhead screen, and as they show you, you're actually doing it. With 40 majors, Seton Hall is preparing the next generation of leaders for a global society. Join the learning revolution at Seton Hall. There are children waiting to be adopted all across New Jersey. 
they want to be part of a family picture, just like yours. So if you've thought about it, bringing a child who'd love to have someone to call mom or dad into your family, maybe this is the time to do something about it, right now. You know, you don't have to adopt an older child, but wouldn't it be something if you did? Many voices, many visions, many songs, many dances, many cultures, many faces. One people, one place. New Jersey Performing Arts Center. All the world on stage. Don't miss the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater appearing at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center May 11th through 13th. Call 1-888-GO-NJPAC today or order online at www.njpac.org. One on One congratulates Steve Adubato on this year's Mid-Atlantic Emmy Award for Outstanding Host. Welcome back. We're speaking with David Blankenhorn, the author of Follow This America. David, what year did the book come out? 1995. 1995. It's funny because uh, I tell you, I, I, it's one of the first books I read in 1995, right after uh, I got divorced. And I was obsessed over this question of what it would mean to my then three-year-old little boy and our relationship. Right. And I have to tell you, I was, uh, I was uncomfortable with a lot of the things you were saying in the book. I felt challenged by a lot of the things you were saying in the book, and I look forward to having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I didn't think it would take six years. But let, me, let me go through it a little bit. Sure. You argue that more and more kids are growing up either without their dad in the home or without their dad in the home full-time. Right. So my son grows up, and millions of other kids grow up without their dad in the home full-time. Now, you have sons of your own. I have one son. One son. Two daughters. Two daughters. I want to believe that even though my son has been impacted by this, that we have a great relationship. He's with me a lot of the time. He's with his mom a lot of the time. We're both great parents. And not that his life is better for it, because I think we delude ourselves in thinking that, but if there's such a thing as a, quote, not a good divorce, but a better divorce, where the kid is an integral part of it, it can be all right. Am I deluding myself? I don't know. I mean, it's certainly better to have an amicable divorce and it's certainly better you know to have that um, continuing relationship with your child you know obviously that's what I mean that's the main thing but it's not the same as us being together because you were saying before no. every kid needs both of their parents to to love each other and to love him or her yeah yeah uh, it's not the same uh, the child goes back and forth there's two separate homes there's two sort of family stories, which at a certain point conflict with one another. Do they and have to? Sure. Why don't, the, the child's going to think a lot about why the two parents who he loves most don't love each other anymore. And, uh, you know, you can give him some phrases to memorize, but it's not going to be an easy process, of course. Um, you know, look, but lots of other things happen to all of us who sure. are not, you know, it's not like this is a sentence of doom, but you, since you ask, I mean, it's not, no, it's not the same. It's not the same for the child. Look, you know what's happening? The, 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 the kids who grew up in the sort of divorce revolution, the oldest of them now are entering young adulthood, and they're beginning to have their voices heard. They're beginning to write things and say what it was like. And, um, and uh, you know, the, this new book by Judith Waller, yes. One of the foremost experts on the subject, this longitudinal study she did with these kids. The 25-year study. And, you know, they don't, you know, they, look, this is not about trying to make everybody feel bad, but it, it's just, for the sake of honesty, you, you need to hear it, too, from their point of view. Sure. It's not a, um, um, uh, it, it's just, um, they, the children want their mothers and fathers to be there mm. and to be there for each other. And when that is taken away from them, uh, the whole issue of trust becomes harder. But you know, David, I guess the issue that I have with you and, and Judith Wallerstein is I very rarely hear you talk about 
the implications for a child in a family whose parents stay together who really shouldn't be together? Well, there's been a quite a bit of work done in that area. And for example, there was a book uh, last uh, couple of years ago called uh, Generation at Risk, where the scholars tried to ask this question. They said, well, OK, what about all these fighting, unhappy parents? Wouldn't it be better for the children if the parents split and, and, uh, and were happier? individually, wouldn't that ultimately be better for the children? And the answer was, as best they could determine it, uh, no. In about 70% of the time, uh, they, they estimate that about 30% uh, of the divorces that take place today are so high conflict where people are just, you know, there's certain seriously wrong, you know, their people are being hit, or there's abuse of some kind, or so on. And are, there's such an emotional thing that the fighting in front of the children, using the children as pawns. Okay, and let's take that out of the equation for a second. Seventy percent right. are relatively low conflict things. Wallerstein the rest of us, yeah. has, the, has the same conclusion. If it's just an issue of what's good for the children, it seems fairly clear that it's better for the children if those marriages stay together because children have a much higher tolerance for parental conflict than do parents. Mm -hmm. As long as you keep it behind closed doors and you're there for them, they're pretty much happy as clams. Uh, uh, and again, it doesn't mean that people should be miserable and stay, I mean, you know what I mean, it doesn't tell you what to do, but it just says that if you're just asking the question, what would be best for the children? For a lot of people who are getting divorced today, it clearly would be better to stay together, if, if that's the only question. Okay. Let's uh, shift gears. You, you've done some interesting, fascinating research together with the folks down at um, Morehouse, the Morehouse Research right. Institute. Talk to us about that. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Obi Clayton, the head of the Morehouse Research Institute, and I started talking several years ago about the whole issue of black fathers, Morehouse being a historically black right. college in Atlanta. And uh, because for a long time, this whole issue was seen as kind of a black issue, you know? Going back to the Moynihan Report in 1965, right. everybody Senator said... Patrick Moynihan from New York, but right. he was not a senator, was a professor, I think, he, at Harvard. Well, he was, and he worked in the Kennedy ad, uh, administration in the Department of Labor, and a famous report where he talked about what he called the tangle of pathology in the right. black family. And from then until really the 80s, this was, when you talk about the missing father, people thought, oh, you're talking about African Americans. And you and people like Pat Moynihan weren't supposed to talk about it because you're white. Exactly. But a funny thing happened is that now the white rates of father absence are higher than they were for African Americans when this whole issue came up. So it's no longer a black or white issue, it's a kind of an everybody issue. So we thought the time was right to bring together uh, a number of scholars, mostly black and some white, to talk about the issue of putting the issue of black fatherhood back really on the agenda. So we had a great conference and we put out a great public statement called Turning the Corner on Father Absence in Black America. Uh, about 80% of black kids in the country spend a lot of their childhood apart from their father. It's, it's, it's a huge problem. And, uh, the problems facing black men are, are, are numerous, and there's, it's a pretty difficult, complicated issue, but we thought it was important to tackle, and the more people at Morehouse did it, it was just a great experience and uh, put me in touch with a lot of great black leaders around the country. Let me ask you, is, more, is this issue, not just for black America, I hate when people say black America as if there's lots of different Americas. Right. I guess for some people that may be the case in terms of how they see it, but in the African-American community in this country, this is a huge issue. Why don't I hear Al Sharpton talking about it? Why don't I hear Jesse Jackson talking about it? Why don't I hear a lot of the better-known African-American leaders talking about this as a real high priority? What am I missing? Well, I wish you heard, did hear more of them talking about it. Occasionally you do. Um, Why do you think they don't <coughs> make it a higher priority? Racial profiling is a high priority for them, rightfully so. But what about this? I'm not exactly sure. I think that 
they may feel that if this becomes some big public thing that they talk about to white people and in the media and so on, that somehow this will lead to this phenomenon of sort of what they would call blaming the victim. That would be that people will just point their fingers and say, oh yeah, those black people are all messed up, none of the men take responsibility, you know, that it becomes a kind of a, almost a racist kind of stereotyping of the whole community. So they prefer to keep it, they don't prefer to talk about it much publicly. They would prefer to point to problems that are external, you know, racism, you know, job opportunities and so on. All real. All real. What are the implications or what is the impact from your perspective on the Jesse Jacksons and Al Sharpens of the world not making this and the quasi Fumes who head up the uh, NAACP, what is the impact from your point of view after studying this for many years of not having it be a super high priority publicly for all of us to hear to deal with, but them driving it? I'd say it's just a, a great tragedy for, for these children, you know, it's just, it's just putting a kind of a political thing and a kind of a sensitivity thing ahead of the, of the needs of these children. That's a great tragedy. It's a tragedy when white people do it. It's a tragedy when black people do when it. When anyone does it. When anyone does it. Because the victims are innocent children. That's right. You know, I remember Sports Illustrated did this piece a while back on uh, some sports figures. Right. Who uh, get paid an awful lot of money to One do what they do. One of my heroes, Larry Bird, was in that list. Shocking. Shocking. And uh, a lot of guys, you know. Tell folks what that was about who <clears throat> maybe didn't see it. Well, a lot of these uh, very, uh, you know, big NBA, National Basketball Association stars, uh, some of them had, had three, four, five different children with three, four, five different women, uh, none of whom they were married to. And they, a lot of them paid child support. It wasn't that big a deal. They were all multimillionaires. But they weren't there. But they weren't there for the kids. It kind of reminded me, in a way, of this whole, remember the whole Murphy Brown thing back in 1992, where he had the, it was a TV show, it got all caught up in politics, and the, you know, a kind of a middle class, college educated woman on the TV show decided to have a baby, and she's, she's single. And the whole debate, and, and what, what you often heard was, well, she's financially, you know, she's financially able, you know, let's don't point, point a finger at her. Or these basketball guys, oh, well, they're paying child support, you know. And, you know, I mean, you know, in your situation, you know, the money's the least of it, right? It's the relationship, it's the, it's, it's the, it's, you know, it's, it's the father that's the issue. That money doesn't buy you a relationship. No. Not all the money in the world could no. do. It. It's funny, Larry, Larry Bird and some others, you know, look, they're not supposed to be role, well, you know, I'm not going to play the role model game, but I will tell you, it struck me that, uh, that Bird, and also my childhood sports hero, I mean, Dr. J. Yeah, that's right, I forgot about that. You know, am I wrong about that? I, I, I think you're maybe right. Okay, there was something there. And then again, you know, I got to put Jesse Jackson in this as well, because as we do this program in January, we find out information, you know, about his own situation, yeah. and be they black or white fathers, should it be our business? It is our business. Uh, By the way, millions of people whose names we don't know because they're not high-profile people do the same thing. That's right. What can we make of those others, and can we turn that into some sort of positive? Because I don't want to just hurt those guys. I don't want to hurt those, uh, embarrass them. I want to. We want to do something for the kids. Is there a way to do that? Yes. The the way to, you know, <laughs> the most important thing that changes our minds, <laughs> you know, more than the law, more than anything else, and the 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 mindset has to be that every child deserves a father. Right. Every child who's brought into this world deserves a father. Now, they're not all going to get it, but we ought to want it really badly. And if they're black, if they're white, if they're daughters or sons, they all deserve fathers. And when we, as a society, or as individuals, or how, do things that uh, cause children not to have a loving father in their life, mm. we're doing something wrong. That's it. We just have to say, we're, that's wrong. Does fatherhood come naturally 
two and four, most of us, or are we supposed to get trained or taught this somewhere? Well, I think that men have a, a kind of a built-in capacity to father. You know, you know, you hand. Uh, do you remember the first time you held your ch child? Uh, about six seconds after he was born. And you know, uh, that feeling that you get, it's unbelievable. And uh, so, sure, I think there's a kind of a nurturing quality in men, not as much as in the mother, um, and therefore, and also men are relatively hardwired for things like uh, promiscuity, aggressive behavior, competing with other men. They want to, you know, there's the, there's, that, there's the male thing that leads you away, you know, more than is going to lead mothers away. So there's a social need to reinforce fatherhood. If you just take an agnostic position, like you don't care what happens, most of the mothers will stick with their children. A lot of the fathers will drift. So you need to have a society that kind of embraces these guys, you know, and says being a father is really great. Celebrates it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and gives them respect for being in that role. Let's do this. We're up against this last break. We have about a minute and a half when we come back uh, from that break. We're speaking with David Blankenhorn. He is the author of Fatherless America. It came out in 1995, but it is still relevant today. Talking more about fatherhood when we come back. Stay with us. One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you by the Innovation Garden State, a Prosperity New Jersey initiative. PSENG, the St. Barnabas Healthcare System, Seton Hall University, and by the Private Bank at Summit Bank. Additional funding is provided by the Mix Group of Companies, New Jersey Division of Youth and Family Services, Community Education Centers, and by Qualcare. One on One with Steve Adubato is also brought to you by these public spirited corporations and organizations. Promotional support provided by Business News New Jersey. Read Steve Adubato's column every Monday in the Star Ledger's business section. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area, now offering limousine service in more than 300 cities around the United States. Welcome back. Got a minute or so left with David Blackenhorn. David, what have we missed in this whole fatherhood question? as we're talking about. And by the way, I should let everyone know that the Institute for American Values, we've been putting up the website throughout the program where you can find out more about David's work. What have we missed? I think the one thing we've missed is that there's a kind of a movement out there, and it's been such an honor for me to be associated with it in the last few years. There are a lot of people, mostly men, fathers, who are really trying to do something about this. A lot of people say, oh, what can you do? But there are some terrific efforts out there, groups like the National Fatherhood Initiative, Charles Ballard's National Institute for Responsible Fatherhood. They're really doing the outreach, bringing young guys, connecting them up to their children. So there's some good hope. There's reason to believe that we can turn this trend around. I'll tell you what, uh, with all due respect to the moms out there, and they are great, particularly mine, I have the best mom in the world. Second. Second, okay, because you're here. <laughs> becoming a dad, becoming a father, by far the most rewarding, enjoyable, thrilling experience of my life. How about yours? You know, getting my wife and becoming a father. That's it. It's, it's the transforming experience. It's the deepest thing there is. Thank you so much.